So this is a talk on Newton Cartan theory. So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit okay. <coughs> about the landscape of work that's been done on Newton Cartan theory, both within physics and within philosophy. Um, so this is the physics branch, and this is the philosophy branch. And this talk will, in some sense, bring these two branches together, as I'm about to explain. Um, for a long time, Newton Cartan theory has been seen within physics as a kind of curiosity, a curious way of making um, Newtonian space-time and Newtonian gravitation curved, uh, still spatially flat, but nonetheless a curved space-time. And this changed uh, in the early 2000s when Dumpton Son realized that Newton Cartan theory is a really good framework for thinking about con certain phenomena in condensed matter physics, especially the quantum Hall effect. So all of a sudden, um, you saw Newton Cartan theory being used in modern quantum Hall effect. And from this work in condensed matter physics, there's an outgrowth to non relativistic holography uh, and also a comparison with Hojava Lifshitz gravity, um, the form of gravity that posits an asymmetry between space and time. So this work does not make any reference, actually, to um, the philosophical literature on newton cartan theory. That's a slightly different case, because um, within the, the philosophy world, there's been lots of continuous work on newton cartan theory since you know, Troutman. And, and here, there have been several issues that have been discussed. One is not in terms of using newton cartan theory to resolve certain kinds of conceptual puzzles about Newtonian cosmology. That's not at all something I'm going to talk about today, actually, but it, it is one branch of the philosophical work on newton cartan theory. Another branch of the philosophical work is in talk about um, what it means for two theories to be empirically equivalent, in particular, what it means for newton cartan gravitation to be empirically empirically equivalent to standard Newtonian gravitation, even though it provides a curved space-time model instead of a flat space-time model. And um, related to this issue of empirical equivalence has also been um, a discussion of space-time functionalism within the context of newton cartan theory. And here I'm thinking primarily of Eleanor Knox, uh, with a view that has precedence in Harvey Brown's work. Um, and also, this has received some discussion in the work of uh, Simon Saunders and David Wallace. So that's that whole cluster of issues. And in, in that body of work, there's something like the following thought. Characterize space-time um, as what performs certain functional role, what characterizes inertial structure. And if you characterize space-time this way, you'll see that newton cartan space-time is really playing that role for Newtonian gravitation instead of the flat models of space-time that we're used to so associating with, Newton uh, with Newtonian gravitation. Um, I, I really got into this work by reading, by first reading the physics literature and, and then revisiting, not revisiting, but visiting the philosophical literature. And I realized that um, there's a gap in these two bodies of work. One way of getting at this gap is by noticing that they have different conceptions of what gauge structure or gauge symmetry is in these two theories. Uh, so at least superficially, different conceptions of what gauge is. Okay. And um, what I'm going to talk about is how to close this gap. How to close the gap between what physicists understand to be the gauge, the gauge symmetry of newton cartan theory and what, within the context of philosophical debate, people have usually taken to be the gauge symmetry of Newtonian gravitation, and thus of Newton-Cartan theory. And what we're going to see is that closing this gap, in fact, gives us a new interpretation of a piece of uh, conceptual physical mathematics that's much discussed within philosophical literature, the notion of a recovery theorem, the notion of being able to start with a Newton Cartan model of gravitation and to recover a collection 
of Newtonian models of gravitation. And the converse of that is what people call geometrization, being able to start with a Newtonian model of gravitation and construct from that a Newton-Cartan model of gravitation. Uh, so that's what, I, that's what I hope to accomplish, both to clarify the relationship between these two notions of gauge, and then to show that that, that will lead to a new interpretation of recovery theorems, which will in turn have certain implications uh, for the philosophical debate. But one of these implications is uh, it will clarify our understanding of what it might mean to say that uh, gravity set on Maxwell spacetime is equivalent to Newton Cartan gravitation. I won't dwell for a long time on this particular implication because it's going to fall out more or less directly um, from my claims about gauge and recovery. So here's the rough mathematical setup. You see, oh yes. Sorry, the should have used a thicker pen. So we begin with a d-dimensional manifold. So let's just say d is four, and uh, we demand that the manifold is contractible. Or alternatively, if you like, you can look at a contractible patch of a of, of four manifold. And then we have the following geometric structures. So first, we have a clock one form T. And we ask that this one form is closed so that we can integrate it to get absolute time. Now, once you have this clock one form, so it's called a clock one form because it, it tells you about the passing of time. Uh, you can define what it means for a vector to be time-like or space-like. So a vector is uh, time-like if, when you hit it with this clock one form, it's greater than zero and pointing in the forward direction, right? So I've just normalized it and said unit time-like vector t of n equals to 1. And a vector is space-like if it's annihilated by this clock one form. OK? That's the first level of structure. It lets us say what time-like and space-like vectors are. Um, the second piece of structure is this tensor with upper indices HAB, which is often called a metric. It's not really a metric because it's degenerate. It, the signature is 0 plus 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 in four dimensions. So it's degenerate in um, the time direction. Um, what does it mean with zero instead of minus? Is it just a it's, it's degenerate in, in yeah. If, if I diagonalize it, right? It's degenerate. Yeah, okay, yeah. so. Yeah. In that yeah. dimension. Yes. Right. So the, the signature is just the eigenvalues, right? Yeah. Good. Um, <coughs> And yeah, to be precise, we demand this compatibility condition between um, the clock one form and this so-called spatial metric that's degenerate in the time direction. And so we say that uh, a Newton-Cartan theory of we physicists generally say a Newton-Cartan theory is at least the following set of structures. It's this collection of things, m contractible, clock one form, spatial metric, which I've together jointly called L, curly L Leibnizian geometry, along with a connection that's compatible with the Leibnizian geometry. Right. By compatible, I mean the same thing that people mean when they talk about the compatibility of a connection with the metric in Lorentzian geometry except that now, that there's, now there's two structures that the connection needs to be compatible with. It needs to be compatible with a clock one form T, and it needs to be compatible with this spatial metric H. Right? Um, and what compatibility, compatibility means in this context is that the connection annihilates these geometric structures. Good? And so I put dots here for extra fields. Right? So when it says, say, hey, hey, we have a Newton-Cartan theory, we mean you have a Leibnizian geometry, you have a connection that's compatible with Leibnizian geometry, and you have a bunch of extra fields. OK, so how has this setup been applied in recent physics? As I mentioned, it's been applied to the quantum Hall effect, really impressive applications. 
where they can um, compute actually more than you can compute with uh, standard models of the quantum Hall effect, um, like chern simons theory. Um, it's also been used as a limit of soliton solutions in twister theory. So you might think, oh, twister theory is clearly relativistic. How does Newton-Cartan theory come, come into the mix? So um, Maciek Donaisky at Cambridge is, and his student, uh, James Gundry, have shown that there's a way of taking a limit of these twister solutions such that you recover Newton-Cartan theory as that limit. Um, it's a group uh, from Chicago, uh, Grassi Prabhu Roberts, who've developed Newton-Cartan theory as a Wielbein theory of gravity. So I, 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 I'm using the term uh, Wielbein. I don't actually mean, this VL, like I said, four. I don't actually mean four. It could be anything, right? But um, the idea here is very similar to this 19... When you've written fields, it means many. Many. Oh, it's okay. Good. So, yeah, good. Yes. V, many. V is for the field is many. Oh, wait, good. Excellent. Right. So, I saved myself by yeah. a mistake. No, I don't think it's a mistake. I think I when when you when you write it, when it's the dimensionalities can be anything. Right. You write it with an L. With an L. It's okay. Good. Excellent. <coughs> yeah. Um. So uh, yes, some of you will know there is this. Uh, um, so 1982, I think it was 1982 paper by Witten, and other people have worked on similar things where you really try to write uh, gravity as a gauge theory, right? So by gauge theory, I mean here Young Mills type gauge theory. So he shows that in two plus one dimensions, general relativity can be put into the form of uh, a Chern Simons gauge theory, where the trick is that for the connection A, you have to take the spin connection plus a co-frame connection. The spin connection is valued in f, small so, one, three, and then this is the translation part. It comes from here. Um, and you can do something very similar for Newton-Cartan theory, except uh, without an action. And so uh, these people have, have done that. And finally, this holographic applications, which I'm not going to uh, discuss, and there's also extensions to the torsionful case, which I'm not going to discuss. So everything I'm going to say about the theory today is torsion-free. It's a torsion-free connection. Just as in standard general relativity, we assume that the connection is torsion-free. Okay, so those are the physics applications. I now want to return to the philosophy of literature. So what do people obsess about within the philosophy literature? There is this theorem called the Trotman Recovery Theorem. And I'm going to tell you now, remind you of what it says. <coughs> These two columns represent a model of Newtonian gravitation on the one hand, and a model of Newton-Cartan gravitation on the other hand, I call it NCG. And here I'm, I've told you about the, uh, the data of the models. So. Um, of course, all, since all this is data of the models, but the thing I've called data here in this row refers to connections and fields. Right? And then these are the equations in motion. These are uh, the source equations. And this is the curvature of the background spacetime. Okay. So let's start with something very familiar, the Newtonian gravitation models. So, uh, and we're writing them in covariant form, right? So uh, the data is a connection that's compatible with a Leibniz in geometry, a potential field, phi, a mass density, rho, and um, a time-like vector field, n, that represents the trajectory of some body. And then we have the equations of motion, which uh, as you know, this is just the, uh, so alpha I've used for the acceleration. And here we have um, a covariant form of the acceleration. And that's just the derivative, the covariant derivative of the potential. Right. And for the source term, we have this uh, standard uh, Laplacian of the potential 
is equal, equal to a multiple of the mass density. And finally, because it's standard Newtonian gravitation, the space time is flat, right? zero curvature. Okay. So that's the familiar thing. On the right hand side is this more exotic thing. It's a Newton Cartan model of gravitation uh, with less data. Less data because this potential field is going to get absorbed into the geometry of space time. So data is only a connection compatible Leibnizian geometry, mass density rho, and this material time like vector field n. The equation of motion is also simplified. It's just the geodesic equation of motion. It just says that the acceleration vanishes, right? And um, the source equation is going to now come in a geometrized form. It says that the Ricci tensor, RAB, is 4 pi rho times uh, two clock forms, TA, TB, right? which you need to put these, these things in there to get uh, the right tensorial indices. And um, so from this, you see that if rho is not zero, it's got to be curved. And finally, there are extra curvature conditions, which um, I don't want to talk about too much right now. There's three of them. Uh, these are all conditions on the Riemann curvature tensor. The thing that's going to be very important for us is this last condition, which I've called the Newtonian condition. It's, a, again, a condition on the, Re on the Riemann curvature tensor. But I haven't written it out in that form, because I'm going to use uh, a special form of it later. So what I just remembered something that kind of important that I should have told you a while ago, which is that we basically have an hour and a half, not two hours. OK. Right. So I'll try to go faster. OK. So what the Trouble Recovery Theorem tells you is that given a model of Newtonian, Newton, uh, New, given a model of Newton-Cartan gravitation, you can recover a collection of models of Newton, Newtonian gravitation. And the reverse of that is to say that given one of these models, you can re re reconstruct an empirically equivalent corresponding model of Newton-Cartan gravitation. Right? So recovery geometrization. Yeah, so I've just set that here. And here's a, um, a more precise uh, qualification. So when we say that from Newton-Cartan gravitation, we can reconstruct Newtonian gravitation, we mean up to the following symmetry. Uh, a symmetry where you change the connection, like so, by the addition of this term. And simultaneously, you change a potential by a scalar field, psi, where the scalar field uh, satisfies, basically, it's a harmonic condition, right? That two derivatives equals a zero. So if you've read this uh, philosophical literature, you'll have seen the standard proofs of the trauma recovery theorem. They're not pretty. Um, and one gets the feeling that really ought to be a cleanest statement about relationship between a very small set of parameters. One way of understanding this talk from a purely technical perspective is as articulating what uh, the morally correct relationship is. More broadly, at any rate, the symmetry of trot and recovery is what usually gets referred to as gauge symmetry within the philosophical context. So I mean this symmetry, where you transform the connection like this, and you transform the uh, potential field like this. People talk about it as the gauge symmetry of the neo-Newtonian models. And um, Eleanor Knox makes this point very clearly in her BJPS paper. On the other hand, physicists seem to have a very different idea of what the gauge symmetry of the Newton-Cartan theory is. Here's what they say it is. So I've put these technical conditions up here to make it correct. But roughly, the Newton-Cartan connection can be specified by the, by the following uh, data, nf, where n is a time-like vector field, and f is a two-form up to the following gauge symmetry. You transform the time-like vector field by a space-like vector field. And you transform the two-form 
by adding um, d of a one form. So I'll tell you what, what the expression of this one form is later on. But for now, it, it just suffices to note that it's a one form, and that the one form is going to be um, involve both the parameters n, this n, and this v. Right. Both go into a definition of this one form. So that looks looks really quite different from from this thing that philosophers call the gauge symmetry of new Newtonian spacetime. Right. What was n again? N is a time-like vector field. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this sort of symmetry has played an important role in a philosophical literature uh, in motivating the passage to Newton-Cartan space-time models and gravitation. The reasoning is one that will be very familiar. Look, there's this redundancy of description. Right? So really, you should, the most perspicuous description of Newton gravitation is the one that's gauge invariant, and that would be the Newton-Cartan description, where you don't have, in some sense, you don't have explicitly this gauge symmetry. Again, compare it to this thing. So what is the relationship between these two notions of gauge symmetry? Well, um, why even think that they're related? Right? So the context looks quite different. It looks like there's two different levels of generality here. What I've called trauma recovery, it uses a lot more data than these very general models of Newton-Cartan theory, which I've, mentioned, I've said are being used in condensed matter physics. There's a conceptual argument that they should be related. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go over it. Let me just say I'll sidestep such quibbles by actually giving a direct construction of this relationship. But in order to give this construction, I'll need to discuss n dependent objects in Newton Cartan gravity. Um, n here is, I'll friend the time like vector field, right? A vector field that's annihilate, that's um, such that when you hit it with t, it's positive. So let me define the set of such vector fields. Curly F, the set of unit time-like vector fields. And this just makes it clear, M and T in parentheses make it clear that both of these objects are used in a definition of this set of vector fields. N is going to be a member of this set. We can call it a dynamical vector field, or we can call it a vector field of observers, because any observer is going to be uh, move on an integral curve of such a time-like vector field. <coughs> this set of unit time-like vector fields, it naturally carries the action of a certain symmetry group called the Milne group. It's a very simple symmetry. Um, it just transforms any such time-like vector field by adding a space-like vector field. Now, note that the space-like vector field could be time-dependent. Um, the action is as well-behaved as you might hope for. It's free, in the sense that there's no fixed points. It never gets you to, to a point where you know, keep on acting and it stays there. And it's transitive, in the sense that between any two points, you can find a symmetry that takes them from one point to the other. So, I. I mentioned we're going to define n-dependent objects, and now I've just told you what these n's are. And I've told you what symmetry acts on n's. They don't need to be tangent to sort of inertial trajectories, though, right? We're going to, they don't need, no, no. So this is at a level of abstraction in which there's no inertial structure. We're going to get to inertial structure. OK. OK. So now, uh, this is our first n-dependent object. It's it, the, the covariant n-dependent me metric. So. Recall that in defining a Leibnizian geometry, I said that it had one of the structures of the geometry was this. So the people in Geneva can't see that? Oh. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Can I, if I read it here, can they see? If you, if you write it like really big, they, no, no, it's not because it's not oh, in the video, it's just it's not. It's because it's not, yeah, yeah, okay. 
if you write it like really big, they may see it. Right? So H with two indices on top. Right? This is the um, degenerate spatial metric. And because it's degenerate, it's non-invertible. So we can't just invert it to get uh, a metric with indices downstairs. So how do we construct a metric with indices downstairs? Well, we construct it as an n-dependent object. This is what I'm now going to explain. So you construct it by taking um, the spatial projection of any two vectors, x and y. So this is just a projector defined in the standard way. And then taking now truly just the spatial part of this h, a, b upstairs metric. And since the projector uses its definition n, the resulting covariant metric with indices downstairs is also going to depend on n. And any object that depends on n, I put an n upstairs to make it perfectly explicit that it depends on n. Okay? Now the question for us is, under these kinds of symmetry transformations, this known transformations, where n goes to n plus v, how do the n-dependent tensorial objects transform? So if I actually diagonalize the metric and inverted just the, the spatial part, that would correspond to then a particular choice of n, is that right? Diagonalize which metric? The well, the HAB that's, I mean... H I, upper AB? Yeah. Yes. So it's, I mean, if I diagonalized it, yes. so I then just had a purely spatial bit, I could invert that, right? Yes, you, you can, you can invert... That would, you can invert that would you correspond can, to a particular choice of n on this other prescription, I guess. You, so you can invert the spatial bit, right? And this is that, this is that spatial bit. Right. And the, the choice of n comes in in the arguments, right? So I'm using n here to project. project. So yes, yeah, some particular choice of n is going to be used. Right, so on, you can ask now, under a Milne, tra a Milne symmetry transformation on n, how does the n-dependent object transform? So this covariant metric is going to go to another such metric with n prime on top. Right. I won't write the explicit formula because it's messy, but... Now, one thing that um, people study in uh, relativistic... Uh, fluids is this idea of vorticity. Right? If I take a blob of fluid in space-time and I assume it doesn't expand, right? um, does it spin? And you can measure the extent to which it rotates. In newton cartan geometry, this, this uh, measure of how much it rotates is called the vorticity, and it's an n-dependent object. So you can see where the n's come in explicitly. The, this uh, covariant h that depends on n is used, as is n itself. Right. And you can see that it's anti-symmetric, uh, because it's anti-symmetrized. So this is just a graphical representation of what happens when the expansion is zero, and the vorticity is non-zero, and I put a blob of fluid in there. It that ball turns. Okay, similarly, the expansion of a, a, a blob of fluid represented by how far these time-like vectors diverge is also an independent object. And it's a symmetric independent object. I've symmetrized these indices. And finally, the really, really the simplest thing, acceleration, is clearly also an independent object. And again, we can study how it transforms under this Milne symmetry transformation. So why are we interested in these three parameters, vorticity, expansion, and acceleration? Well, one reason is that um, if we know all these three, we also know what the covariant derivative is because of this formula. We know what the covariant derivative is in terms of the vorticity, how much it rotates, the expansion, and the acceleration. Okay. <coughs> How much time do I have left? Um, so, you know, we'll go to, like, 
another 45 minutes or an hour. Okay. Um, including questions. Including questions. Okay. So, so. Um, so I've just told you about these independent objects. And now I want to tell you how they figure in a strategy for representing newton cartan connections that will allow us to appreciate the relationship between what physicists take to be the gauge symmetry of newton cartan theory and what philosophers take to be the gauge symmetry of neo-Newtonian models. First, let's begin with a disanalogy um, between general relativity and Lorentzian geometry on the one hand, and Leibnizian geometry and Newton Cartan theory on the other hand. Okay. So it's, it's often remarked that while Riemannian or Lorentzian geometry has a fundamental theorem expressing the uniqueness of a torsion free connection, this property fails for Leibnizian geometry. I'm going to remind you what I mean by Leib Leibnizian geometry is um, a manifold equipped with a clock one form and this degenerate spatial metric H, A, B upstairs. Um, let me expand a little bit on this first point. What is the fundamental theorem of Riemannian and Lorentzian geometry? It says that uh, given a uh, manifold with a Riemannian metric, there exists a unique torsion-free connection, namely the one that is compatible with that metric. For any geometry with degenerate metric structures, that kind of fundamental theorem is going to fail. Instead of having a unique compatible connection, you have a whole space of compatible connections. However, Beckert and Moran, these um, French mathematical physicists, notice that there's also an important analogy actually, between the Lorentzian case and the Leibnizian case that's relevant for Newton-Cartan theory. And this analogy only comes into view if we're willing to consider the torsionful Lorentzian case. Because once you, you, ask, you allow connections that are torsionful, you no longer get uniqueness, even if you require compatibility with uh, the metric structure, you no longer have a unique connection. Although a torsion-full compatible connection is not uniquely determined by Lorentzian geometry, there is nonetheless a standard represent representational strategy for how to uniquely pick out a torsion-full Lorentzian connection. You need to add some extra data. And here's the strategy. Okay. First, just take the affine space of connections on a Lorentzian manifold. Right. So it's an affine space. Um, it's, in the sense, it's like a vector space that's missing an origin. Right? And we say that uh, the vector space it would be if it had that origin is the model vector space for that affine space. So more succinctly, we say that it's an affine space modeled on some vector space curly V. Okay. So um, now we want to consider connections that are compatible with the metric structure. So we need to impose these compatib compatibility relations on the model vector space. And we say that there's a new affine space, right? Now the af new affine space of compatible connections. By making a choice of origin for the affine space, one can construct an isomorphism between the affine space with choice of origin and the, the vector space it's modeled on. There may not be a unique one, but any of the vector spaces it's modeled on. And the representational strategy that Beckert and Moran noticed was possible was that, look, an arbitrary torsion-full connection can then be represented as a vector from the origin connection. Right, so does this make sense? So compati I mean, compatibility really is like an equivalence relation? It's an equivalence relation. Okay. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just okay. defining now a new affine space, the affine space of compatible connections. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the point is that if I want to pick out a particular connection in this affine space, one way of doing so is choosing an origin, choosing a point in the affine space. 
which will itself be a connection, right? Because it's a space of connection. So choosing an origin which is a, a connection. And then drawing a vector from that origin to the relevant connection that I want to pick out. <clears throat> now, of course, there's a sense in which the choice of origin is arbitrary, but it's affine space connections. We could have chosen any one, and the representational strategy would have worked. But there's also a particular perspicuous choice in this case. Namely, take the model vector space, V prime, to be the space of torsion data. Right. Now, this is a great choice, because it exhibits a certain kind of virtue of simplicity. So the origin, we, we think, should be as simple as possible relative to the space, to the model vector space. So we take the origin to be the zero vector, namely the torsionless connection. Thus, once we implement the strategy, we see that there is uh, a most perspicuous choice of origin, which is simply the levi chivita connection. And that is picked out uniquely by uh, the requirement of compatibility with the metric. Right? So thus, we can now write an arbitrary torsion-full connection by means of the following device. That arbitrary connection is going to be the origin, which is the levi chivita connection, torsionless, compatible with the metric, plus some torsion data. And the torsion data tells us exactly how much torsion this connection has. So again, this connection is going to be represented as a vector in the space of connections. And the choice of um, the origin is going to be physically perspicuous. It's going to be the torsionless connection, the unique one. Let's introduce some terminology for this. We say that this pair, origin, or what I've called a reference point data, and the directional data that gives you actually gives you the vector, represents this connection. So Becker and Moran noticed that this strategy could also be implemented for Newton-Cartan connections, but with one important difference. So again, we, we go through this whole business about the space of connections. So uh, I've used curly C to denote the space of compatible Newton-Cartan connections on a Leibnizian geometry. It's easy to see that the model vector space for this affine space is the space of two forms on the manifold. Now what you need to do is to pick an isomorphism between this equipped with a choice of origin and this in order to implement the strategy. The strategy of representing an arbitrary connection by means of a vector from the origin to that connection. So I've called this isomorphism theta. It's a bad choice because I also use theta for expansion, but whatever. Um, and there's a, f a formula here for what exactly this isomorphism does. It maps, it maps a connection in a space of connections to a two-form in an n-dependent way. So, uh, the origin th is then going to be given just by the inverse of uh, the zero uh, vector. And thus, the reference connection, nabla, that plays the role of this origin is going to be picked out by a definite description, I claim. The definite description is the following. The newton cartan connection, such that this two-form vanishes. Right? So let me go back again. It was a bit quick. This was the isomorphism between the space of connections equipped with an origin and the space of two forms. I want to know what the reference connection is, how it should be characterized. I take the inverse of the zero vector, and a zero means f equals a zero, right? So this reference connection, this origin now, is going to be characterized as the newton cartan connection, such that this two-form f vanishes. Okay. Old result from newton, physics newton cartan literature. For any time-like vector field n, there exists, oh sorry, let me back up. This uh, 
connection such that the two form Fn vanishes, we call a special connection. The old Sorry result. about the noise, by the way. With yeah. any luck, they'll knock off for lunch at 12. Yeah. So maybe they'll. So, old result for any time like vector field n, there exists a unique special Newton Cartan connection. So, in other words, an arbitrary Newton Cartan connection can be represented in the following way. Here's the arbitrary connection in the space of connections. We choose an origin, namely um, a special Newton Cartan connection. And I, I, I have a little n on top, because remember that the isomorphism itself was n dependent, right? And this is a two form Fn. That it's, it's a vector that from this origin to that connection that picks out this connection uniquely. So because of this old result, instead of writing nabla can be identified with the pair not special nabla n and fn, we can just write n and fn, right? Because of this particular result. Um, and, and furthermore, nabla n itself, this is just a tautology, but I'm telling it to you to make sure uh, you understand the notation. Nabla n itself can be picked out by means of n zero. When this, so when this vector fn is zero, then it will just pick out nabla n itself, the special connection. Now you might think that this is just a cool mathematical device, but it's in fact more than that. It's very physically perspicuous. Because of the interpretation of the two form f, in the same paper, Beckett and Moran show that the physical information contained in the two form f is precisely the vorticity of n and the acceleration of n. In other words, f is uh, a physical tensor. It, it captures the rotational acceleration and it captures the linear acceleration of this time-like vector field n. What does the word perspicuous mean? Uh, it's you know, a good choice, right? It's a good choice, yeah. I it's kind of fancy, that yeah, yeah. Like yes, but, but good, so natural, has, 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 has theoretical explanatory virtues oh, in a makes sense. Makes clear. Makes clear, yeah. Um, so so in, the, in the literature, other people have called Fn the Newton Coriolis two form, precisely for this reason, that it contains the linear acceleration and the rotational acceleration. And these two, if you know these two, you also know F. It exhausts what the content of F is. Okay. This actually tells us something about inertia. Let's come back to the next question. <coughs> Again, the representation NF of some arbitrary Newton-Cartan connection can be understood as quantifying the acceleration and vorticity of that arbitrary connection with respect to some special connection, nabla n. The origin with respect to which this is picked out by means of a vector f. Since f, namely the linear acceleration alpha and the vorticity omega, vanish with respect to the special connection nabla n, with respect to the special connection nabla n, the vector field n looks like inertial trajectory right? because the acceleration vanishes. So we can think of this nabla n, the special connection, as a generalized inertial structure. It's an inertial background, put it that way, or effective inertial background. There's two qualifications here that lead me to say it's generalized. One qualification is that when people talk about uh, inertia in, Newton, in the context of Newton-Cartan theory, and especially the Trotton recovery theorem, they're usually thinking of linear acceleration. And second, in discussions, you know, traditional discussions of initial frames, there's the built-in concept of laws taking the same form in all frames, maybe the simplest form. And none of this is part of our generalized notion of inertial structure. That's why I call it a generalized notion. OK, so much for the analogy between um, Newton-Cartan theory and torsionful Lorentzian geometry. It's got us this far. We still have to note that there's residue, which cannot be made completely analogous. And the residue is this. 
in the Newton Cartan case, picking out the origin by means of a definite description gives you not a proper definite description, doesn't give you a unique thing. It gives you what philosophers of language call an improper definite description, right? Multiple things are picked out by the definite description. Um, thus, there's a whole family of possible reference points that can be picked out in this way. And as you could probably guess by now, the family is, is parameterized by this choice of n. Thus, this family of representations, n, f, n, is going to be related by the Milne symmetry. When I transform n to n prime under a Milne symmetry transformation, f also has to transform in the following way. Okay. I'm not going to bore you with the details of what this phi is right now. Okay. So now we can revisit the, the notion, clarify the, the physicist notion of gauge transformation. These representations nf and the symmetries connecting them are precisely the physicist's gauge choices for the Newton-Cartan connection. So say so the Milne symmetry connect, I mean, it's just another representation of the same connection, right? Yes, what, okay. if we include in, if we let it act also on the two form f. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, so it induces that that transformation F. And so it, 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 it is this gauge symmetry. Right. Now, of course, the Newton-Cartan connection is well-defined independently of any such representation. But given that you're, it, w once you've decided, I'm going to use these representations to describe Newton-Cartan connection, you can prove a symmetry-based equivalence that's invariant between, on the one hand, the Newton-Cartan connections and on the other hand, symmetry orbits, right? So it's invariant now because it's an orbit. And th the statement goes as follows. There's a canonical isomorphism between the space of Newton-Cartan connections and Milne orbits of these representations n f. So it's not by Milne orbit of representation, I mean not one particular n f, but let the symmetry group act and trace out an entire surface of NFs. Now, each of the space of such orbits is going to be um, in bijective correspondence with the space of Newton-Cartan connections. OK, so now we get to this Newtonian curvature condition that I didn't write out explicit view earlier, but it's used, uh, importantly, within the Trotman recovery theorem. <coughs> a better way of saying the Newtonian condition, instead of writing it out in terms of the Riemann curvature tensor, is by saying that, the new, that all Newton Coriolis two forms f are closed. So what does that mean? That means that d of f equals to 0. So I'm not going to prove this, but uh, it's well known. So the, Poin the Poincaré lemma, anytime you have a closed form and you're, you're on a, a contractible space, you can apply the Poincaré lemma. It's on a contractible manifold. Uh, any closed two form, uh, sorry, any closed form is also exact. So by the Poincaré lemma, actually any of the previous representations can, be, can also be written as uh, this pair n and a gauge field, this one form a with, uh, that depends on n, where f equals to d of a. And this actually expands our symmetry. So now we have representations on which it's not just the known symmetry acting. There's also this standard u1, Maxwell gauge symmetry, acting on representations. And I've written the new representations like this, where um, this equivalence class uh, represents an orbit of the Maxwell gauge symmetry, which is just A plus some closed uh, zero form, F. A plus some exact uh, one form. Once we have these gauge fields, you can really see how to construct Milne invariant objects, objects that invariant under the Milne symmetry that I, I mentioned earlier. And there are exactly three. We can construct the scalar Milne invariant. 
a time-like unit vector Milne invariant, and a metric Milne invariant. For each of these objects, if I transform n by a Milne symmetry, the object remains the same. OK, so now we're in a position where we can start to see both how to reinterpret Troutman recovery and to understand what's the relationship between the physicist's conception of gauge and um, the philosopher's conception of the gauge symmetry of a collection of neo-Newtonian models. Our strategy will be to first prove a generalization and then to recover Troutman recovery as a special case. Now, <coughs> So at this point, this stops becoming about Becker and Moran's work, and it starts becoming about, about my work. Um, there is a generalization of trauma recovery that's well known in the literature. It's called the kunzel ellis recovery theorem. Okay. That's this direction of the diagram. The Troutman recovery theorem assumes two curvature conditions, R1, the Newtonian condition, and R2, this other thing. Um, and this second curvature condition, that r upper ab lower cd equals to zero, can be translated in, into an equivalent form as another curvature condition r2 prime, conjoined with the existence of a vorticity-free uh, time-like vector field and an, ex an expansion-free or rigid time-like vector field. The well-known direction of generalization says, drop the twistlessness condition. Drop the condition that omega equals to zero. So there's another direction of generalization that had not been explored in the literature uh, that I, I realized actually corresponds to a new generalization of uh, trauma recovery. And that's to drop the rigidity condition. This, this gives us what I call proto-recovery. So you need some technical like propositions in order to make this kind of thing work. Um, so here are some easy facts. Uh, I gave you a definition of Nabla being Newtonian earlier, namely uh, F, all Fs are closed, right? And this turns out to be equivalent to the existence of a vector field that is twistless. And furthermore, a vector field, a timely vector field is twistless just in case that timely vector field can be expressed as um, a shift of the Milne invariant vector field. So, why are we trying to introduce all these kinds of technical propositions? The, the reason why, just, let me say something big picture about the Trout recovery theorem. Well, one of the reasons why the standard proofs of the theorem are messy and, you know, a little bit unilluminating is because they don't make full use of the symmetry data, the Milne symmetry of um, the space of observers in newton cartan theory. So essentially what we're trying to do is to prove enough small technical results that we can really use the symmetry data to produce an elegant version of, an elegant more general version of recovery theorems. Right, so you need these kinds of things. Okay, so given a representation now as n and a gauge field of an arbitrary newton cartan connection, can show that you can always mill boost this to a twistless representation, a representation where this vector field has vanishing vorticity, and there's, it's going to be accompanied by a corresponding gauge field labeled by this twistless vector field, right? By twistless, I mean the vorticity vanishes. Um, and we can write out this, this gauge field. Turns out that, that we can write this gauge field explicitly in terms of phi, um, the Milne invariant, the scalar Milne invariant, and the clock form. Okay, since the clock form is a canonical object that's just part of the background geometry, what this means is that there's a canonical correspondence between this representation and this representation. And this we call the Maxwell representation. What's so special about it is that the data of this representation of an arbitrary Newton Cartan uh, connection is uh, Milne invariant. It's data that's invariant under Milne transformations. 
And the, the, stru the way the structure of the proof actually is going to be that to use the representation theory to, to understand that this Milne invariant scalar turns out to be the potential in the recovered model of Newtonian gravitation. Right. So I've just more or less said this. Um, and this tells you exactly how the uh, Milne invariant scalar transforms under shifts, Maxwell transformation. <coughs> so now you might think that we would lose some invariant content by passing to the Maxwell uh, representations. But actually, there's a canonical isomorphism between the affine space of Newtonian connections and the affine space of Maxwell orbits. So this is very much like that result I told you about earlier, right? <coughs> Except now we've imposed a Newtonian condition in space of connections. And you can see that instead of um, picking out a Newtonian connection directly, you can just pick it out as a particular <coughs> Maxwell orbit of this representation. So now we can prove this extremely general recovery theorem. When I, the two sides of what I call the A model and the B model. Uh, unlike the Troutman recovery theorem, it's not the case that one side is flat and the other is curved. So this is more general than that. Both could be curved. The data of the A model is going to be the analog of the geometrized side in newton uh in the Troutman recovery theorem. It is a Newtonian connection and a time-like vector field. And it satisfies the Geodes equation of motion. And it only, it only obeys the, curve, the Newtonian curvature condition. On the B model side, you have a uh, special connection indexed by Z. And you have this Milne invariant scalar. And you have, again, a time-like vector field N. And you see that the acceleration of n with respect to this connection is going to be given as the derivative of the potential. Right. So this is already simulating, in a very general way, what the Troutman recovery theorem is trying to do, namely relate a geometrized model without a potential to Newtonian gravitation with a potential. And um, the statement of the theorem is that given an A model, we can recover a Maxwell orbit of B models. Right. In fact, you can show that through this um, canonical isomorphism, an A model can be identified with a Maxwell orbit of B models. Okay. The second statement here is that of the theorem is that all these models share the same vorticity. In other words, all the models share the same standards, standard of rotation. OK, so this is a very general version of uh, some results that, that people like um, Neil Dewar and Jim Weatherall have been uh, trying to prove uh, by, through applications of the Troutman recovery theorem. Um, they've been concerned to show that gravitation set on Maxwell spacetime namely space-time with a standard of rotation, but no standard general standard of acceleration, is equivalent to newton cartan gravitation. And this is a direct and geometrical statement that shows at a high level of generality why this has to be true. Right. Because you can directly identify the A model with the Maxwell orbit of B models. Right. And any of the models Either models in this orbit or models or the A model all share the same vorticity, so they share the same standard of rotation. Okay, the proof is uh, a bit involved, but uh, you can summarize it actually in the following diagram, where this is the connection of the A model. This is um, a special connection that's used as an origin to represent this, where we've chosen Z to be twistless. This is a special connection which is again used as an origin to represent this, 
where n is the trajectory, the vector field of the trajectory of particles. And now we just explore the relationship between using this to represent that and using this to represent this. And everything falls out of this analysis. So I, I won't go through. You can kind of go through the, uh, the analysis step by step, but I, I won't do that. Um, I will show you something, show you a really nice uh, small argument that help, that lies at the heart of, of why, given a Newton-Cartan model of gravitation, you can recover a set of models whose background spacetimes all share the same standard of uh, standard rotation. The reason is that the Newtonian condition said that f equals to uh, f is closed. So f is closed, you get this gauge field A, right? The gauge field A has a U1 symmetry. And what you can compute directly is that under the action of this U1 gauge symmetry, the vorticity um, of these, the vorticity of these uh, reference background spacetimes is always going to be the same. Because when I, you know, I transform by um, the U1 shift, uh, D of D equals a zero. So you can compute directly that this U invariance under this U1 gauge symmetry is precisely the reason you have a standard of rotation, a shared standard of rotation for all the background spacetimes of the recovered models. <coughs> okay. You can now prove the Troutman recovery theorem as a special case of this proto-recovery theorem. To do so, you need to add an additional gauge fixing, namely this rigidity uh, constraint. And you need to add source equations. It works. You get um, all known results about Maxwell spacetime for free. And furthermore, there's a non-trivial check which shows you that the result really is the same as the classic Troutman theorem. Because it, when you do things in this way, then um, go back really quickly. This is right at the beginning, unfortunately. Okay, recall the standard, uh, the standard um, formulation of uh, recovering the Newtonian gravitational models from a Newton-Cartan model, right? And here you have this, what looks like a straightforward statement that when phi goes to phi prime, uh, this constraint is satisfied. So this, this harmonic gauge condition, it actually becomes something you can compute uh, when you do things in this general way. And the, the computation works out. So you can recover precisely this gauge condition. Fast forward. Good. OK, so now some morals. I mean, there's many things to talk about here. I've just chosen a few highlights. We're used to thinking of Newton-Cartan gravitation and Newtonian gravitation as the two empirically equivalent models. But what this apparatus of representations and proto-recovery teaches you is that really there's a whole family of empirically equivalent models that you can construct from this known symmetry. And um, you can taxonomize it in terms of this table. Uh, the top row represents all the different gauge fixing conditions that you can choose. So these are conditions on the, the time-like vector fields. So the simplest one is where you choose the gauge fixing condition to be both twistless and rigid. In this case, you get the equation of motion uh, for standard Newtonian gravitation. And you get the source constraint, Poisson's equation, for standard Newtonian gravitation. Right? Good? And this is what people usually think of as the recovered model. Right? But as I said, our apparatus now shows you that there's a whole family you can recover. Suppose instead of choosing twistless and rigid, you chose twistless and non-rigid. You would still have the same equation of motion but your source constraint would now receive a correction from the Ricci tensor. So in this case, you could have a non-flat spacetime. But still, with um, 
the same equation of motion as standard Newtonian gravitation. Now, suppose you, you chose instead twisted and rigid. So by twisted, I just mean non-twistless. Suppose you chose twisted and rigid. Then you would have a different equation of motion, more complicated one, namely the standard Newtonian equation corrected by a term that involves f, the two form. On the other hand, the source constraint, the source equation, would still be the same as Poisson's equation. And finally, you have this most complicated column where it's twisted and not rigid. This is the vector field you've chosen as your sort of reference frame for the background. And, and here, your equation of motion gets a correction from f, and your source constraint gets a, a Ricci curvature correction. <coughs> Nonetheless, there's an important distinction between all these models and the Newton-Cartan gravitational model. These are geometric backgrounds with additional fields. The Newton-Cartan model is not. Um, however, when equipped with the relevant symmetry, when you're willing to make statements about orbits of these recovered models, you, really, you can now make an invariant statement. You can say that a collection of geometric background models is equivalent to the Newton-Cartan geometry. Um, thus, this is one of the properties that makes the collection of Newtonian gravitation models so special. The curvature conditions on the Newton-Cartan gravitational side are exactly equivalent to the existence of the relevant gauge fixing conditions on the Newtonian gravitational side. So I want to claim that in this whole family of things, these are still special because they're, they're picked out by um, the gauge fixing conditions that correspond exactly to the curvature constraints on the Newton Cartan side. Okay. The second moral is about geometrization. Um, typically, when people talk about the kind of geometrization that goes on Newton Cartan theory, they only ever talk about geom ge geom geometrizing away uh, linear acceleration to get the geodesic equation on a curved spacetime, right? Geometrizing away linear acceleration on flat spacetime to get the geodesic equation on curved spacetime. Given the kinds of techniques we've been um, discussing, and I also do this in a paper, it's clear that the attempt to geometrize away linear acceleration privileges only one of the parameters of the Newton-Cartan connection. It privileges only the acceleration. And there's two parameters in F. There's the acceleration and there's the vorticity, the rotation or the rotational acceleration. Uh, could you instead privilege the vorticity and have a theorem that begins with a model with vorticity and then you geometrize away the vorticity? So the answer is yes, you can do it. Right? It's, it'll, you flip the structure of the proof that I just gave. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay, let, I'm going to skip these two points uh, in the interest of time. The, it, it's clear from what we've been discussing that the, in, in some respects there is an analogy between uh, the Chapman recovery theorem and Newton Cartan theory on the one hand, and U1 gauge theory, Maxwell gauge theory on the other hand. Right? The level of this analogy is at the level of what I call the Maxwell symmetry, that U1 gauge symmetry. And to the extent that the Newtonian condition, when imposed, allows you um, to construct a gauge potential that transforms under the symmetry. However, there's also uh, a big disanalogy because the Chapman theorem uses both the Milne and the Maxwell symmetry. To, one way of summarizing this is by saying that, look, to the extent that um, the philosophical literature has noticed that there's an analogy between Newton-Cartan gravitation and uh, Maxwell U1 gauge theory. This is all about uh, applications of the Poincaré lemma. This, there's nothing deeper going on in here. Right? Um, Newton-Cartan theory has a further aspect, which is this Milne symmetry. So some open questions raised by this work. So the machinery here may, develop, may provide resources to tackle 
the famously difficult question of why there is no variational formulation for Newton Cartan gravitation. Why is it that this apparently very simple model of gravitation does not have an action principle? Um, and that's something um, I'm working on. Uh, second, um, it may also provide the resources to connect Newton Cartan gravitation with other kinds of theories like Hojava Lifshitz gravity. Um, and so you might wonder whether we can understand the philosophical debate about Newton Cartan cosmology as a statement about Hojava Lifshitz gravity. Um, I, think, I think there's some background reasons to think that this might be illuminating, that might be possible, um, related to scale dependence. And finally, is there a special relationship between uh, Newton Cartan theory and Chern Simon's theory in lower dimensions? Might this lead to a better understanding of the relevant boundary conditions that you can place on the theory? Right? Um, might there be topological solitons in Newton Cartan theory or um, analogs of Wilson loops? What would, what would such things even mean? So notice that the entire philosophical discussion, and indeed today's discussion, always assumes that space time is contractible. Right. Um, what kinds of Newton Cartan gravitational phenomena can you have when space time is not contractible? Furthermore, notice that the proof of Chapman recovery crucially uses this property that space time is contractible because of the Poincare lemma. So once you're willing to consider more serious gauge theoretic phenomena that involve non-contractible space times, you're out of the realm of recovery. You're out of the realm of this kind of empirical equivalence. Good. So that's, I think, a good place to end. <clears throat> Questions? <coughs> Do you guys have any questions? You should start. You said we should start. Do you have a question? I have a bunch. Um, so, am I right in thinking that when you are applying the Poincare lemma, you're then quotient out to take the orbit sense, the orbit here? Model, so it's like an equivalence class of connections that gives the rotation standard. Yes. So it seems to me that, I mean, this is. Wait, so you, yeah, sorry. This, I mean, sorry, you, you can make an equivalence class out of it, but you don't have to. Right, but so it seems really important to me which you do. Uh, the reason being that um, that's the. So you, there's one of the points that you skipped, and this is just saying that. But so um, if you do take it, then there's no real categorical structure. But if you don't, then there is. And that's the structure that's going to mess up your like boundary conditions and determinism and stuff that Wallace has been pointing out about this reformulation. Because once uh, you put, when you put boundary conditions, it's in some sense the same thing as making it no, more, no longer contractible. And so... Um, yes, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, but everything is contractible, right? So that's why I don't care. Well, that in this case. Yeah. But, so I guess the question is um, yes. So the question the question is do you need a do you need to really use a groupoid if yeah uh, you're you want to consider non trapped phenomena the answer is of course yeah right um, and so it would be the same as the groupoid of gauge fields in you want gauge theory that you really need it to do a stackification yeah um, and so I'm starting to wonder how different it really is from the Maxwell theory. Um, I mean, I, it's not clear to me exactly what would, like, what we're asking when we ask how, whether it's different or the same. Yes. Um, so, um, in t you know, like you might ask, well, why is there this recovery structure, right? And okay. The the reason for that is uh, one of the main structural reasons is Poincaré's lemma, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if you want to represent Poincaré's lemma categorically, you can, yeah. but it wouldn't profit you much, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it helps a little bit, because you can get on the data, but other than that, like... Well, but, so, right, but that's, I mean, so if you're interested in, in stacks, right, then I think, yes, that's a different, yeah, that's, that's another, re but you, you shouldn't try to 
represent Poincaré's lemma categorically for the sake of representing. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Poincaré's lemma categorically. Uh, yes, did I answer your question, or was there I think something so, yeah. else unanswered? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, so one one way in which there there is an you know, obvious disanalogy is that um, d f equals to zero in Maxwell gauge theory is a an equation of motion. Oh yeah, that was right? another one of my questions. Yeah, yeah. but d f equals to zero here is a constraint that you're putting on your curved model, um, on your geometric model, right. a curved geometric model of gravitation, and. Um, and what that constraint tells you about is the existence it, of a gauge fixing. Yeah. Right. So that, that's an, an, an aspect that you don't really get again in the U1 case. So the, the DF equals zero. The closest condition, right? In the Maxwell case, then you just get the symmetry in the gauge fields. Um, here you have that too, but. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, what makes the kind of argument I gave work is that from this condition, you can get a combination of both the, the U1 gauge symmetry and you can also get show the existence of this twistless gauge fixing condition. And they coincide, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I think you should think of df equals zero in the Maxwell case as kinematic, too. But yeah, well, it is, it is kinematic, right? It's a yeah, right? So, I mean, we, we call it an equation of motion, but. Well, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I keep asking. So I, I did have one more thing. When yes. you're saying gauge fixing. So if, if A equals to, if you define F equals to DA, then in that sense, it, it becomes kinematic. Right. Yeah. Um, when you're saying gauge fixing here, what do you mean by that? Do you mean just a choice of representative from the equivalence class? Or? Uh, no. Um, I mean a choice of, uh, a choice of, particular choice of representation. Um, with which to represent the an arbitrary Newtonian connection, right? Now, if now notice that the, the orbits so this is referring to the slide that's like three or four back. Yeah. So I have to sort of, okay, so that yeah, right. This is what you're talking about right now, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a way in which like I'm not really, of course, an orbit is an equivalent class, but. Um, I'm not really using the equivalence classes here. I, I always just remember the full structure of the orbit. Yeah. 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 So in a way, I'm using the group point, right? Sure. Um, uh, which was this? <coughs> yeah, I think it was. It was what exactly was my. So yeah. So see, this is this is a particular gauge choice to represent this. Here, I've chosen z twistless. That's what I mean by gauge choice, right? And you, how do you recover the, the Newtonian models of gravitation? You have to choose z twist less, and then you also have to choose the rigid. That's how, and that's what I mean by gauge choice. Um, one crucial thing to note is that picking curvature conditions doesn't is not the same as picking the gauge choice. It just proves the existence of the gauge choice. Okay, that's that's the answer to my question. Yeah. My questions, I think, were considerably more simple-minded than that. Go back to the. Can you go back to the? Uh, yeah. So that's what I'm go back to that gauge. Uh, which that table that we were just looking at a minute ago. Yeah. <coughs> so the gauge fixed. Uh, uh, I guess I'm a little confused about what's going on because yes. the things. Entries in the table. Well, I don't know. Some of them look like they're from. The, are they all from the, the Newtonian gravity? So this corresponds to Newtonian gravity case. This column. This is the Newtonian gravity case. Right. Right. And what I I told you is that the Newtonian gravity case corresponds to a particular gauge fixing. So it corresponds to the gauge the gauge fix on the Newton Cartan side. Yeah. With the twistless and rigid. rigid. Uh, and rigid. Yeah. And then that. Then there's the representation of recovery theorem gives us back Newtonian gravity. gravity. And I so see. The, this and this connection, so the other, but then the other three columns are giving us something totally new. Yes. 
I mean, in a way, it's not surprising, right? It's, you know, once you see that, you can do all these different gauge really parameterizations. Gauge choices along the top, so these things are all equivalent. I mean, uh, they're all equivalent. So these things are all representations of um, a Newton-Cartan uh, theory of Newton gravitation. Newton One Newton-Cartan theory of gravitation. So they're all empirically equivalent. All empirically equivalent. In whatever the yeah. right sense of that is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a technical sense. You're right, you're right. They, they predict the same the same uh, vector field and trajectory of the material body. You get a Newtonian gravity, but can you get Einsteinian gravity? Uh, from, well, from, from this structure, uh, no. Oh. Yeah, because these are all non relativistic uh -huh. structures. Now, there is, um, there is an analogous question for Einsteinian gravity, namely, can you use the, sorry, let me back up a little bit. I'm trying to say this in a cleaner way. One way of understanding this work, in fact, is a direction I'm, I'm working on right now with Derek Weiss, is um, as trying to construct from the structure of the observer vector fields, namely the structure of things like n and z, right? Structure of things like n and z prime. These are the observer vector fields, right? Trying to reconstruct from the structure of observer vector fields the structure of space time. Um, so in some sense, that is what is going on here. Uh, now you, you can, going back to your question about Einstein and gravity, you can ask, can you do this for Einstein and gravity? And in, in some ways, that's actually easier to understand. And the answer is, is yes, you can do that for Einstein and gravity. Uh, it's been done by uh, Stefan Gillen and Eric Weiss, where you, you start with an abstract uh, space of observer, abstract space of observers, which is a contact manifold. And from there, you can show that um, you can prove a representation theorem such that you can recover back Lorentzian spacetime out of the structure of the space of observers. Do you have a publication with a list of references? Uh, so this, this work, sorry, which, about what references for which? Sure, there's at least people you've been talking about, the Milne, Bruce, the Chaudhman. Yes, so um, this work is, is forthcoming in philosophy of science, and that paper, I'll send it to you. It has the references. Yeah. Could, could yes. I kind of want to finish up my question. Yes. <clears throat> Just so, can you go right back to the, the ver almost the very beginning where you were first motivating things? Yes. I think if you just hold it down, it would probably be possible through it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. A bit more. A bit more. No, you went too far. Okay, so one before that. Hmm. Even the so standard formulation. Okay. All right. So we have this. So I think this is the way things set up, and I kind of want to just hear it from you. Yeah. How to return to this question? So okay. So this 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 the thing that philosophers know about. Yeah. And then you can go to the two slides down from there. Okay. And here's the thing the physicists say. Yeah. And how do they turn out to be the same thing? Yes. Is the bottom line, right? Yes, that's but I kind of got lost in the details. Oh, sorry. So extent. that was that. So I, maybe I, you can I, just yeah, say yeah, yeah. I, I said that when I kind of yes, when I when I when I said how to recover the Trumpman uh, theorem, but I probably didn't emphasize it enough. Yeah. Um, and so the point is that if you impose the Newtonian condition on this that f is closed, then you can prove this proto recovery theorem, right? And I show that that's like choosing a certain gauge fixing. It is choosing a certain gauge fixing if, if you define gauge fixing in a particular way. Now, I then show that by adding a further gauge fixing, essentially it's something like choosing harmonic gauge, you can get all the way to this. Right. Where now you, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll say it carefully. In order to get this, sorry. The proto recovery theorem is a partial gauge fixing. That's still gauge symmetry left. I show that you can add a further gauge fixing that's still partial, right? It's just more mm -hmm. than proto recovery. And when you do the second layer, you get this. Okay. So yeah. it's sort of implicitly in the recovery theorem. It's implicitly that's in the recovery theorem. Let's see here. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Fantastic. Yes. Good. Good. 
So in, in the end, you have a lot of, of uh, empirically equivalent formulations. Yes. But I'm just comparing to thinking analogous to questions in, in duality, uh, uh, duality, and asking the question about what ontological conclusions you want to draw from this. Yeah. Uh, do you see all of this <coughs> as kind of uh, they're empirically equivalent by, by their contenders, or do you see them as the same thing, physically the same thing, not logically the same thing? And in, if, if that is the case, how do you kind of extract that? Maybe, I mean, in the end, you said something that you wanted to reconstruct space time purely from the observable vector fields, or something like that. The observer vector fields, not the observable, but the, the vector fields of observers. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, so is that something that would result in, in more of a kind of unique reconstruction of space time based on, on that uh, setup rather than these kind of alternatives? Because sometimes you have a, a flat space and other times you have a curved space. Yes, yes. But, but your so kind of reconstruction will be unique. Yes, so that there's re is really, I think there's two different questions here. Okay. Right? Um, the first question is, um, do I regard um, all these different empirically equivalent models as being physically equivalent. Yeah. Um, and I think this is first, you know, there's background questions here about how to individuate theories, sure. right? How to visualize models. Um, if you take as a minimum criterion that they have to be formally equivalent, then they, they clearly fail that criterion, right? Because the um, recovered models, I'm not formally equivalent to the Newton-Cartan model. Um, rather, the Newton-Cartan model is, in a formal sense, equivalent to an orbit of the recovered models. Right. Um, so then you might say, oh, OK, now we ask the question, do you take that orbit <laughs> to be physically the same thing? Um, and well, if, if you're talking about just contractible space, if we, we, we allow those kinds of you know, qualifications, then I think the answer is yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and in part because uh, any of the ontological suggestions wouldn't, I think, come from the, well, the orbit itself, but rather individual models. Of course, so there are people like, um, Saunders seems to have a different view about this, because Saunders thinks that um, Newton Cartan spacetime is more perspicuously described as uh, a background geometry of Maxwell spacetime plus fields on Maxwell spacetime. So you can you can try to split hairs like this. I, I don't, yeah. But you you don't have any kind of strong view. I don't have yeah. I mean, I, I'm inclined towards just saying they, they seem to me obviously to be extremely close, right? So. I don't see what. And then the other question about this, but the space that you construct from that. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is that if, if you, I mean, sorry, it, 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 there is one negative thing to say here, right? Which is that why should you think of space time um, as just a geometry? Why should you characterize space time as just a geometry instead of characterizing it in terms of some functional role? Uh, so this is Eleanor's reason for thinking that um, it's inadequate to say that the background geometry is Maxwell spacetime, and then you add fields. Because if you want to take, an, if you want spacetime to be the kind of thing that accounts for initial structure, then you're naturally led to consider the, the whole Newton-Cartan spacetime. Yeah. Could you just say a little bit more about the notion of empirical equivalence? That's yes. Taken? Yes. I mean, just intuitively. Yes. Yes. Namely that. Um, Theory one and theory two are empirically equivalent if, just in case, the, um, the, the um, observer vector field that represents the trajectory of the observer the, about whom they're trying to make predictions and which satisfies their respective equations of motion turns out to be the same. So that's the notion of empirical equivalence. Having fixed, of course, the mass distribution, all those other things.
sorry, the, the, the vector field is the material body. Let's just no, 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 we'll use the vector field. Sorry, just a second. The vector field is the material body that you're you're trying to make predictions about. Right? Because your your equations of motion always involve some like your acceleration. always involves some n, right? Mm -hmm. n is the vector field that represents some material body about which you're using the theory to make predictions. Right. right. So <coughs> given some particular mass distribution, the two theories have to predict the same n. Okay. Yeah. Of course, the equations of motion are going to be different. But the, so it's but be the, the same n relative the, to the mass distribution. Sure. So you have to fix the mass distribution on both yeah, okay. sides. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you would sort of think. Okay, yeah, it's right. going to sort of the, take any of the the lines that come from the vector field. They're going to pass through the same sort of series of mass densities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's literally the same mass distribution. In one case, it's you 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 stuff it into the Ricci tensor. In the other case, you don't. Right. But it's the same row. Okay. Um, and then, like like I said, this breaks down if. Uh, Poincaré's lemma can't be applied. Okay. okay. Do you guys have any questions over there?